This isn't rocket science, which makes it so painful to think we were still losing big races because of it eight years into our journey. Hey, welcome back to Champion's Journey. Like most families across the United States, uh, we're locked down tight because of this coronavirus situation. But nonetheless, uh, Ronan and I are attempting to uh, bring you guys some high quality derby content to watch during your uh, time at home. If you enjoy the content of what you've been seeing here in the uh, Champion's Journey channel, um, please go ahead and subscribe and like the videos and leave comments. All those things help to increase our search rankings, which in turn gets these videos out in front of more people in Derby, particularly non-Derby families, so we can get new folks into the sport. Really appreciate you guys subscribing and, and liking the videos. Um, Ron and I here are gonna introduce you in the next two episodes into the key elements of getting a car to go fast. Um, we're gonna go through eight different top uh, factors as far as tuning up your chassis. Uh, we, we're gonna have this first episode, we'll introduce them and go through them one by one and talk about the kind of the science and concepts behind each one. And then in the next episode, we're gonna be out in the shop and we're gonna actually demonstrate how you do each of these setup factors. So come on along. All right, before we start talking about the cars, however, I need to ask Ronan a critical question. Uh, in your experience, Ronan, what is the most important single thing uh, to making a gravity-powered race car go fast? Um, I would say the most important things are the driver, um, knowing how to perform well under pressure, uh, knowing your lines to take down the hill, and uh, knowing how to do as little steering as possible and as smooth as steering as possible. Yeah, I totally agree, Ronan. Um, this was something that was a, a hard thing to learn for us. Uh, first couple years in the uh, sport, being an engineer, I thought, well, there's gotta be a way to build a car that's gonna be so good that any kid can get into it and start winning races. And it was really about two years into the sport, uh, we, I met Paul Gale from Los Angeles uh, at, at the Best in the West race in Salem, Oregon. And he really convinced me that we need to look hard at the driver. We need to put concerted effort into our driving and our track reading. And that, that thought sort of um, really let us take our game to the next level. Um, I, um, many of you guys know that I'm a student of, of anything derby technical related. I love reading old material like these derby tech magazines from uh, the 1980s and, and 90s. And, uh, I happen to have one which has a really good uh, article in it around the importance of the driver. This illustration summarizes the opinions of a group of derby experts on the relative impact the driver has on car speed. It shows that all other factors being equal on a long fast track like Akron, the, the finest driver will finish about 18 inches ahead of a good driver, 36 inches ahead of an average driver, 72 inches ahead of a poor driver and a full 144 inches or almost two car lengths ahead of a rookie. All right, so while a car is important, what's the key message here, Ryan? If you want to win, just practice driving. All right, with the importance of the driver clearly established, it is worth noting the car is important as well. But what's important? Um, let's talk a little bit about that. Soapbox Derby, like any other form of competition, attracts a lot of, of uh, curious and smart individuals with a lot of different theories about what's important. Um, let's be honest, it's pretty fun to kind of look for that hidden ingredient, secret ingredient that's going to take your car to the next level and provide what the great uh, race car driver Mark Donahue deemed the unfair advantage. All right, uh, to illustrate the uh, idea of what's important and what isn't, I want to share a couple of funny stories with you. Uh, the first one is uh, 2018, we were racing at the uh, NDR Nats in Sedalia. It was the one and only time my 19-year-old uh, daughter, uh, Willa, raced at that event. And we had her back in her super stock car, which she hadn't been in uh, since she was about 16. Um, she managed to come in second in that race. We're really proud of her for that. 
and had somebody approach us after the race and say, hey, I noticed your car is pretty rough. Is that uh, that uh, finish, orange peel finish in order to, to done purposely to turbulate the boundary layer and lower your drag? I kind of had to burst their bubble and say, no, it's just a matter of we painted the car in the garage, maybe didn't have enough solvent in the paint in our $99 paint gun, and that was uh, the best we uh, could do at the time. The second story I want to tell is around bowed weights. Uh, in 2017, um, Ronan won his first NDR Nats in this car in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, it turns out some of our weights had a very small amount of bow in them, around a sixteenth of an inch or less. Um, this became a sticking point when we got to Akron a month later because there had been some changes to the rules I was unaware of around uh, weight, uh, the weights and the way they were going to be looking at them. Um, so long story short, um, they took a number of our weights um, and they were concerned with the amount of bow in the weights. The compromise that we reached was we would actually turn the weights completely upside down so the bow was bending up away from the floorboard and we ran them that way. Um, I didn't think it was a big deal one way or the other. Um, the bottom line was he ended up winning second at Akron that year um, with uh, one of the fastest master's times that had been put down. And um, so long story short, bowed weights, I think we disproved that as a factor that's of any real merit. Okay, so what really does matter then? Uh, we've pre prepared here what we consider to be the top eight setup factors for chassis speed, and uh, they're, we're going to present them in relative order. Um, I want to note this does not get into aerodynamics. That's a separate topic. It is important, uh, particularly on the sit-up cars or on a legacy car, that, that's important, um, but we will um, get into that more in uh, subsequent episodes. Again, these eight factors are, are in prioritized order. They're all important, so we, we check all of them, but if you're limited on time or you're choosing what tools to invest in, you really want to be able to get the, the top, focus your time and attention on the top factors. They're going to give you the most bang for the buck. In our opinion, the top eight chassis setup factors in order are one, triangulation, also known as tri, tail weight distribution, aka tail, front axle alignment, spindle caster, also known as toe, chassis stiffness, tightness and stability, kingpin torque, cross bind, also known as flatness, and finally, spindle camber, also known as up and down. All right, well then let's take a look at these one by one. Setup factor number one is triangulation of the rear axle, relative to the center line of the car. If the triangulation is off, the car will not track straight and true. The driver will not be able to keep the car in a consistently straight line and the car will be traveling through the air at an angle, impacting the aerodynamics. On a stock car, try a set by adjusting the radius rods and in the other classes through various alignment bolt setups. It's checked by measuring from a point at the center of the front kingpin back to two points on the rear axle, equidistant from the center of the front kingpin. When the two distances shown here as red and green lines are exactly the same, the try is spot on. While try can be checked with a tape measure, it uh, makes it a lot easier and a lot more accurate if you use a triangulation bar like uh, Ronan's holding here. It's a long bar with uh, some points on the end. We'll show how that's used in the next episode when we're out in the shop. Uh, when we're setting up the car for an important race, we want our triangulation to be uh, off by no more than about a 64th of an inch, so it's a pretty precise measurement. The second key factor is tail weight. In other words, the, the difference between the weight on the front axle of the car versus on the rear axle of the car. For any given track and ramp situation, there's an optimal tail weight to get at. If you've got a uh, track uh, with, with a pronounced concave or a significant ramp, it almost always favors a tail weighted car. Uh, for a track which is more flat and the ramps are either flat or non-existent, 
typically a more evenly weighted car. And if you happen to have the rare situation of a convex or a rollover right out of the gate, it may actually favor nose heavy. To understand why tail weight uh, is not exactly easy to figure out, you have to understand the concept uh, that um, that the rolling resistance of a wheel is not linearly related to the weight on the wheel. Uh, if you take uh, a car that is evenly distributed and move more weight from one end to the other, the rolling resistance will actually be a little bit greater on that than an evenly weighted car. Um, the best data I've ever found on this was published back in the 80s in another issue of Derby Tech. And it's a culmination of research of about 30 years by an engineer at SKF Bearings in Sweden. It goes into uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the equations behind rolling resistance on a bearing as a function of weight. The graph we produced here shows a plot of relative bearing friction using this equation for weight ranges and bearing types common to Derby. Note the different tire and bearing types on various soapbox derby wheel types will affect these numbers, but the general characteristics shown here remain the same. The upshot of this chart is as one takes load off one wheel and adds it to another, moving away from an even distribution, the overall net friction increases. For the maximum differentials we typically work with in soapbox derby, this can result in something approaching a 1% increase in overall rolling resistance. Again, this may be offset by a quicker start out of the ramp, but it's a balancing act. The concept shown here will also be important when we discuss cross bind. Our tolerance for tail weight now is somewhere around plus or minus one or two pounds. Uh, this was something we were pretty sloppy with for a long time and it took a series of really painful losses including our daughter placing second at the 2018 NDR and Superstock where I had the tail weight about five pounds off of where it should have been uh, to really kind of have it sink in to my thick skull that you really need to figure out the right tail weight for any given track and you need to get the car right on. So the third factor is front axle alignment. This is basically saying that if the steering wheel is straight, then the front axle should be square to the center line of the car. Yeah, and, and if you don't get this right, then the driver has to cant the wheel as they're rolling down the road in order to get the car to go straight, which isn't uh, ideal. Front axle alignment is only checked after the rear, the rear axle try is complete. This allows measurements to be made between the front and the rear axles out near the wheels to ensure the front axle is squared. As this is done, the final steering cable tension is set as well. There are some tricks to do this job as well, and we'll get into those and we'll demonstrate the adjustments in the shop next episode. Factor number four is spindle caster, also known as toe. This is a very sensitive uh, measurement taken on the front axle and rear axles. Uh, out on the spindles where the wheel bearings spin. Uh, it's measured using a, a spindle bow, which like the one Ronan's holding here. And you make the adjustments using either a spindle wrench or a spindle bender like the kind I have right here. And again, we'll show you in the next episode how those are used out in the shop. Placing the bow on the spindles allows the spindle position to be verified with great accuracy using the attached dial indicator. Ours allows accuracy to a half of one thousandth of an inch. To make adjustments, the wrenches or bender are placed over the axle and spindle, uh, allowing these very fine adjustments to be set. It's really important to get the toe spot on, to avoid having the tires scrub down the road, and also to minimize any side loading of the bearings. It's critical to note that this must be set only after the final steering cable tension is set, which is normally done while setting the front axle square. Even minor changes in cable tension will result in large changes to tow. This is also why during a race it's important for both the driver and car handler to watch the car and avoid any situations where the cable could get pulled or stepped on accidentally. When setting tow for an important race, our tolerance is no more than one thou off and we prefer being full bent forward, if anything, because the spindles tend to work backwards over the course of the day. Factor number five is chassis stiffness 
tightness and stability. Uh, we'll go into the more of the details of that when we're out in the shop next episode. But the basic concept is, uh, has a lot to do with kind of the way you set up and build up your floorboard, choose your floorboard, and some of the other elements on the car. Um, you want things tight. You want things rigid. Um, the idea there is that when we make these very precise settings, we don't want them going in and out of adjustment as you're rolling down the uneven surface of the typical track. Uh, it also has to do with recovering energy as the car is going over bumps as it goes down the track. Factor number six is kingpin tension. Uh, again, we'll get into more details of that in the next episode out in the shop, but the basic concept is um, we like to run our cars tight. Um, and the caveat there is if you're gonna run your car tight, then you have to be concerned with the next factor we'll get into, which is cross bind or getting your car flat. If you don't have a method for getting your car pretty flat, it may actually be better to run at least your front kingpin a little looser. There are also are situations, uh, unusual situations, like if you come across a ramp or a track that particularly in the first area has a lot of unevenness or cross bind in the ramp because the, they haven't set it up properly. Um, in those kinds of situations, you may want to run a loose front kingpin. But in most circumstances, we're advocates of running the car tight. Factor seven is cross bind or how flat the car is. Cross bind has sometimes been called the silent killer. It's really important to getting a quick start at the top races where great care is normally exercised to get very flat ramps. To understand why cross bind matters, think back to that bearing loss slide we previously discussed. If cross bind is present, the wheels on two diagonally opposite corners will have additional load and those on the opposite diagonal will have roughly the same amount less load. The frictional losses, though, being nonlinear, will not cancel out. A crossbound car will have slightly more rolling resistance than a flat car, and this difference is exacerbated at very low speeds. Many teams attempt to measure crossbind using scales, and this can often lead to very inaccurate results. To do this accurately requires the tops of all four scales to be on the exact same plane, each scale deflecting nearly the same amount under load and all four scales accurately calibrated. It's generally much easier and more accurate to check crossbind using either a flat surface or a set of crossbind wires, and we'll show how to do that in the next episode. Our tolerance on crossbind is either two thousandth of an inch if we're on a flat surface, or plus or minus one pound using an accurate set of scales. Our final factor, factor number eight, is spindle camber or up and down. Of all eight factors, camber may be the one with the greatest latitude, but that said, it's still worth getting right. Like caster, it too is checked with a spindle bow. The important thing to note about camber is it must account for the amount of deflection that will occur when the car is fully loaded, including any difference in nose and tail weight. In the next episode, we'll show a couple different ways to set this while accounting for axle deflection. From a practical standpoint, camber settings within about plus or minus five thou are probably good enough to win most races, but nonetheless, we like to have them close to perfect if time allows. That concludes Derby Setup video number one. Join us next time out in the shop. Thanks a lot, you guys, for joining us here on Champion's Journey. We'll see you next time.